gosh. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Andrea Miller, and I'm founding board member and the executive director of Center for Common Ground. I have an additional hat that I'm wearing tonight. And periodically, I'm going to be switching hats. I am also the founding board member and president of National Women's Political Caucus of Virginia. So we are going to start off with some information about where we are in Virginia, what we've done, what we still need to do, how you can volunteer. And then we will bring on our very, very, very special guest, Mandela Barnes. So Josie, uh, next slide. Virginia has a primary on June 20th. The entire Virginia General Assembly is up for re-election, all 140 seats. When they redistricted, what we ended up with was 37 safe Republican districts, 31 safe Democratic districts, and 32 districts that are up for grabs. More than 25 incumbent senators and delegates chose not to run for re-election. Some of the reasons were their new district was less favorable to the party than their old district. Some decided they did not want to run against a fellow incumbent. And Virginia had a handful of senators and delegates who had served for more than 40 years. And let's face it, technically the world is a very different place from where it was 40 years ago in terms of technology. When we look at where we are for women and restoration of rights for returning citizens, yeah, we're back about 40 years, but we don't want to relive that past. We're going to need to make some changes right away. Now, Virginia is the battleground for reproductive choice in the South. We are the last Southern state standing where abortion is still legal in this state. We introduced a reproductive freedom constitutional amendment. So the women of Virginia, we are serious. Virginia will be a state that is safe and fit for women to live. We also will be battling for restoration of voting rights constitutional amendment. Next slide. Um, we already talked about the districts. And when you look, you can see Hampton Roads, Central Virginia, and some places kind of on the northwest side of Virginia are technically up for grabs. Red is Republican, blue is Democrat. And as you can see, Virginia really is a very rural state. Next slide. And this is what we're looking at. In the Virginia House, it's 47 Democrats, 51 Republicans. That makes up the 100 seats. In the Virginia State Senate, there are 22 Dems and there are 18 Republicans. Um, one of our Dems, in air quotes, is a pro-life Dem, boo. Next slide. And again, just the numbers, the partisan control of the House. Next slide. And the partisan control of the Senate. Actually, that's the um, old slide. Um, no, no, you're, you're just fine. That was me. All righty. Now, as I said, Virginia has a primary, and we do a lot of work around elections. Postcard addresses are already available. They became available on April 21st. Our phone banks opened on April 21st. Texting began on May 1st, and early voting began last Friday. Next slide. 
what we realized in Virginia was that in this election, in this primary, possibly more than any other primary where we've done work in Virginia, we were going to need to go in deeper and not just help people to vote. Republicans have basically stopped holding primaries in Virginia. So pretty much the Democratic Party is the main party that holds primary elections. As president of the National Women's Political Caucus, we are a 501c4 endorsing organization. So it made sense for us to begin to move our primary election work over to the C4 side. So the National Women's Political Caucus only endorses women candidates. 40 candidates requested our endorsement and 28 candidates were endorsed. Next slide, please. This is our Senate slate. There are 13 candidates and they literally are all over the state of Virginia, from Northwest Virginia down to Southwest, from Northern Virginia down to Hampton Roads. So our clients for the Senate are statewide. Next slide. And our clients for our endorsed candidates for the Virginia House are also statewide. And when I look at these images, and I forgot to take Sally Hudson's picture off, that was me. When I look at these candidates, I can't help but get excited, number one, by the quality of the candidates that were selected and are running, and the fact that we have candidates all over the state. Next slide. Now, postcards. Center for Common Ground has 60,000 addresses, and there should be approximately 7,800 addresses still available on the C3 side. Center for Common Ground, our postcards and our original phone banks were only to Black voters and Hispanic voters in Virginia. Now, on the C4 side with postcards for Virginia, we are looking at women in Virginia, knowing how important reproductive rights are in Virginia, along with voting rights and education equity. So I've got two postcards that are on the screen. So you're looking at our C3 postcard, reclaim our vote. C3 postcards cannot be used for our more partisan campaign. And then you see our wonderful Lady Liberty postcard. And what's really, really neat and very, very Virginia about that postcard is the artist who drew that Lady Liberty is Maggie Walker's great granddaughter. So we've got a little bit of Virginia history tied in with Virginia's future. Next slide. Now, these are the phone calls that we made on this E3 side. So our paid phone bank team has done an amazing job. Remember, we opened up these phone banks on April 21st and the C3 phone banks are complete. Next slide. We still have a lot of calls that need to be made 
on the C4 side. And we will be adding more phone banks as we get phone bankers. So hint, hint, we need more people to make phone calls where we say our endorsed candidate is X and they will be equality or equity warriors for, and then we say reproductive rights, voting rights, and education equity. Next slide. Texting. The new team of people who have been texting on our C4 side are beyond amazing. As you can see, we are approaching 100,000 texts. I'm thinking we may actually be able to do 300,000 text messages for this primary. Candidates have been letting me know that as they are knocking on the doors. People are saying, I heard about you. I got a text about you from the National Women's Political Caucus of Virginia. Next slide. Now, we've got an upcoming event that is a Virginia event on May 18th at 8 p.m., Restoring the Right to Vote in Virginia. If you are not aware, our governor has decided that he's going to return basically to the 1902 method of restoring rights. He is removing what the past two governors have done, which is nearly automatic restoration upon completion of the sentence or anyone who asks. And he is now going to, eh, I'll restore voting rights if and when I feel like it, because the Constitution basically says I can. Next and last slide. On May 25th, I will be joined by a very dear friend of mine, Heather Booth. And that will be the second installment in the series, Rally for Virginia, the road to Richmond, because reproductive freedom is such a huge issue in Virginia. I couldn't think of a better special guest than the original Jane herself. Josie, thank you for showing my slides. And now I want to introduce Adele McClure, who is running for House of Delegates in District 2 in Arlington, Virginia. So for the past several years, Adele has served as the executive director of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. Her leadership and work has been nationally recognized. And in 2019, she was named Forbes 30 under 30 list for law and policy and also received the National Black Legislative Staff Leadership Council Top 22 of 22 award. Adele would be the first Black and the first Asian American person to represent Arlington County in the Virginia General Assembly. Welcome, Adele. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate you and appreciate all the folks on this call and all that y'all are doing to elect folks in Virginia and also across the nation. So it is my great pleasure uh, to be the person to introduce my dear friend, Mandela Barnes, who has spent his career working for Wisconsin's working people. Uh, he served in the Wisconsin legislature, became the state's 45th lieutenant governor. That's when we met and he was the, the state's second ever black statewide elected official. And so he was very he I mean, ran a historic race, won, and uh, ran a record-breaking U.S. Senate campaign determined to support other diverse and groundbreaking candidates across the country. So I'm so proud of him. He just recently founded the Long Run Pack, uh, 
and he also returned to organizing as president of Power to the Polls Wisconsin, an organization dedicated to empowering underserved voters in Wisconsin. So I'm truly proud to be here. I'm excited to run. I appreciate y'all support. And it is without uh, further ado that I introduce my friend Mandela Barnes. Well, Adele, it is great to see you again. And full disclosure, uh, I she texted me like a week ago, and I just got around to responding to it. So please accept my apologies very publicly. I'm going to publicly apologize for not responding to your text earlier. So I just want to say thank you for the introduction. And I am very, very excited that you're running. Uh, it was a pleasure to have met you then uh, and to know, or I guess I should say to have seen your growth and now for you to become a candidate in such an integral race uh, brings me great joy. So just want to say hello to everybody else. Really excited to be back here. want to thank you to the Center for Common Ground so much for having me back, having me one more time, but especially having me here today. I uh, want to thank you all for the work that you did to help me out, the work that you continue to do to help out other amazing candidates, uh, to make sure that people's voices are truly heard and represented in our democracy. So as Adele said, I'm Mandela Barnes, uh, former Lieutenant Governor of the state of Wisconsin, and I always start my story by saying that it is a very Wisconsin story. So forgive me if you heard it before, but I am absolutely going to repeat it because my story is also a middle class story. And it's a story that families all across this country are able to relate to. Now, I don't come from wealth. I don't come from uh, a politically connected family. I grew up right in the heart of the city of Milwaukee in a proud union household where my dad worked third shift. My mother was a public school teacher. And those union jobs gave my family a ticket to the middle class. And I firmly believe that everybody, every child growing up deserves at least the same opportunities that I had. Now, when I was 16, I had the great fortune of going to college at Alabama A&M University. And while in college, I started in 2003, uh, but shortly after my second semester, I had a chance to watch the 2004 Democratic National Convention. And I heard a speech that made me believe that better was actually possible. And that the issues that I saw facing my community, my friends, my family members, these were issues that we could actually solve if we worked hard enough. And most importantly, I felt that our differences could actually unite us. It was Barack Obama's speech. And from that moment on, I knew I wanted to get involved in one way or in the other. So I started as an organizer right after school as a field organizer on a congressional race in rural Northwest Louisiana. After that, I moved back home to Milwaukee where I served as an intern in the office of uh, Mayor Tom Barrett and went on to become the receptionist in the mayor's office. But then I got back into organizing, but this time it was issue-based organizing. Now, Organizing the city of Milwaukee, it was very, very easy for me to get frustrated with what we saw as a lack of action to address the biggest problems that were challenging us. And I couldn't help but realize that so many of our representatives uh, hadn't walked a mile in our shoes, or if they had, they hadn't bothered to come back to their roots to really address what has been going on. So I decided to step up and run because too many people were comfortable. And at the age of 25, I was elected to the state assembly. And I can say uh, that I didn't necessarily fit in in the state capital in Wisconsin, but I did realize how fortunate I was uh, to be able to provide a voice at the table uh, for so many people that felt that they have been denied that voice. And it was important to me to make sure that we included everybody's voices in the decision-making process. So I took the time to travel the entire state to talk with people from all different walks of life, people whose lives are way different than my own. And it was those experiences that I realized that despite our different stories, we still all want the same basic things for ourselves, for our families, and other people that we love. And it was those conversations and experiences that led me to run for lieutenant governor. And in 2018, I was proud to be alongside Governor Tony Evers to help kick Scott Walker out of office. I'm sure you probably heard of him. Uh, and that race saw me elected as the first Black lieutenant governor of the state of Wisconsin, youngest uh, since the 1800s, youngest lieutenant governor in the country. And I tell everybody, uh, I don't spout out those facts to brag or boast. I spout them out because usually there's a young person in the audience that I'm talking to. Usually it's a person that feels that they don't look like everybody else in politics, so there's no place for them. And I tell my story and I share that because I want them to know uh, that they too can go on and do the same exact thing. 
Now, as Lieutenant Governor, I had the great fortune and wonderful opportunity uh, to address some of our biggest problems. And I always say in our biggest challenges lie our greatest opportunities, whether it was helping our state move forward post-pandemic uh, or serving as a chair of the Governor's Task Force on Climate Change or Census Complete Count Committee. And in 2022, just last year, uh, with the help of so many people who are on the call today, I became Wisconsin's Democratic nominee for the United States Senate. And this is a race that I got in for the same exact reasons that I got into organizing. It is that belief that better is possible, that undying belief that better is possible. And during that race, I stayed true to my values of freedom, of fairness, and of opportunity. And that meant standing up against extremism. It meant campaigning on my belief that everybody deserves a fair shot. People aren't looking for a handout. They just want to be able to put food on the table, go to the doctor and not see a surprise bill and provide quality education for their children, basic needs that people continue to be denied. Now, this last election was some of the most uh, grueling times I've ever experienced, I've ever experienced, excuse me, uh, but it was also some of the most rewarding uh, time uh, times of my life. Uh, most rewarding moments of my life. I traveled to every part of the state of Wisconsin to make sure that I truly showed up everywhere to listen to everyone. And while facing nonstop attacks from extremists, uh, we had to weather the storm and I had a great team around me. There was uh, a lot of wild commercials being aired on TV. There was one commercial that basically ended by saying Mandela Barnes, different. And they didn't basically say that. that was explicitly what the commercial said. Uh, they weren't subtle about it at all. And unfortunately, the race didn't turn out the way we wanted. We came within one percentage point of unseating a two term incumbent. This is the closest incumbent challenge in the entire country for these most recent midterms. We broke state fundraising records and we ran the closest U.S. Senate race in this state in over 100 years. So after the race, it took a lot of time to rest. A lot of time to reflect, a lot of time to recharge. Uh, sometimes I don't know if I took enough time, but whatever, we're here now. And that brings me to what I'm here to talk about tonight. And that is the Long Run PAC. Long Run is a political action committee uh, to help support diverse groundbreaking candidates. It is a longtime passion project of mine. It's an initiative that is dedicated to making sure that those voices actually make it to the table. The young candidates, the diverse candidates, the LGBTQ candidates, the working class candidates, the different candidates. And we want to make sure that folks have the support they need to be successful, especially in critical races. That means the financial support, but also the mentorship, the assistance with staff recruitment and the other tools that candidates need as they begin their long run. Now, I love my personal story because I believe the parts of me that may make me different from other candidates have been central to every one of my campaigns. My middle class, labor values, my desire to invest in our public schools, and my passion to empower community organizers. And I want the long run to invest in those different candidates all across the country early on, because oftentimes we know that it is the different candidates are the ones that go on to make the biggest difference. Now, right now, we're getting ready to roll out our first set of endorsements ahead of the 2024 cycle. And we've already been supporting change making candidates across the country, whether it was our Supreme Court race here in Wisconsin or the work we're already doing now for Senator Tammy Baldwin. And I want to make sure that I'm supporting all type of candidates all across the country to make sure that they're positioned to win those critical races and use their differences to make differences. Now, in addition to the PAC, I've had the honor of returning to my organizing roots, being named power, uh, president of Power to the Polls Wisconsin, which is an organization that's focused on voter turnout and also focused on building long term powerful electoral forces in diverse pockets of our state. Now, we got to work immediately in Wisconsin's critical April Supreme Court election. There were also a couple mayor's races we were to get involved in, in a special election for the state Senate. And I'm looking forward to 2024 and beyond starting now because we got to put in the work to show that we care about people long before we ask for their vote. And we got to show up long after we get that vote or even if we don't get that vote. We still have to show up because that's how we build power. That's how we make the biggest difference. And now I'm excited to answer questions from two change-making candidates from the great from Virginia. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to pro-choice champion, Lasharice Ayer. Good evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mandela, not only for your leadership, but for those great remarks. Um, I'm very excited to join you all this evening. And my question is, um, 
as a uh, former, as a 36 year old uh, who was first elected to the Virginia House of Delegates in my 20s as the youngest woman ever elected and as a current state candidate for Senate running against the last anti-choice Democrat in our state Senate in a primary. Um, I really respect the work you are doing to make a way for the next generation of leaders. Um, as you said, your race saw, I believe, uh, was about a $40 million raise, um, an incredible, unprecedented amount of money, and you came within a percentage point of winning. Um, that leads me to believe that uh, for young leaders of color, it's not just about the money because you did that. And so what do you believe um, has to change in our political discourse uh, to really increase the likelihood of future candidates uh, that follow in a trajectory like yours um, to gain the support not only from our institutional democratic leaders, but that strong um, institutional democratic donor base. Thank you. Well, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, so we got two 36-year-old former state reps here. Uh, so I'll say, though, um, I won't say that it's not about money. It, money is unfortunately, it's a scourge in our politics. And, you know, I, when they told me how much money I was going to have to ra raise, I pretty much curled up into a ball because it is an ungodly amount of money. It is ridiculous that you have to raise that amount of money. Now, dollar for dollar on the candidate side, I actually raised more uh, than the incumbent, but it was the outside spending uh, that dwarfed us, right? Uh, that was the real problem there. Uh, now, I will say, uh, just want to say how grateful I am for the support that we got. It took building a grassroots operation, uh, you know, even in my primary, right? Like I was, you know, I had a couple, you know, people who had deeper personal pockets than, you know, myself and uh, people who spent a lot more money than I raised. Uh, but we were able to, again, create a real movement. You have our low dollar donors really propel us and really uh, give us the momentum and the strength we needed to be successful. Now, I couldn't have run this close of a campaign against a two term incumbent without support uh, from a lot of institutional people. Uh, but it took a while to build those relationships, you know, and that's what it comes down to. Like, I didn't, you know, a lot of people just don't have time or a lot of people don't know where to start. Like, I got my start as a field organizer, I started at the ground level. But I made sure uh, to do my best to uh, engage people whenever and wherever possible, spending my time going across the state. You know, when you mentioned, you know, institutional support, of course, is great to have it. But what's most important is having the support of people on the ground, the support of the people in your district, uh, the people in your home state, the people in your city, the people who are actually going to be voting for you. Uh, there's always going to be chatter. Uh, but the real chatter that matters is the chatter that is going on at home. Now, I run into a lot of people all the time. Like I still, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been on the circuit, back on the circuit, uh, you know, traveling different conferences, meeting people. And one of the toughest parts is when you see candidates who are out of town as much as I am, <laughs> or uh, the candidates you always see, you know, at, at different events. And it's like, I don't know how many voters you're going to get here, right? Like, that's what it truly comes down to is like making sure that you are actually talking to the people who get to cast a ballot for you. And uh, that is what I encourage people to think about all the time. And so I never thought I'd be able to raise that uh, amount of money. Again, like I said, I curled up into a ball when we talked about it from the very beginning. Uh, but that's when I wanted to start the long run to make sure that people uh, can at least get a jump start. Not saying I'm going to raise $40 million for people. I wish I could raise $40 million for every candidate. Uh, but if we can help people uh, get jump started and help them make some initial connections that can get them on their way, uh, then I feel that it's a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I see uh, Ms. Susanna Gibson joined as well. So I'm gonna spotlight her. Welcome, Susanna. I don't know if you can hear us, but um, we're so excited to have you on and for you to meet Mandela. We may have lost her. <laughs> ah. and, oh no! And well, I, know oh, I, was, I know I was supposed to welcome her. My bad on that one. Oh, there she is. There she is. Oh, Sorry, it. it was not letting me on. I was on time. I swear to God. <laughs> All right, there we go. Welcome. Welcome. 
Hello. <laughs> I make I know how to make an entrance. All right. All right, Susanna, your question, please. <laughs> Unmute. We know you're moving from events, so th thanks for being here. <laughs> and no. and phones are tricky. No, oh. no, I am thrilled to be here. It was my computer that wouldn't let me on, not my phone, actually, believe <laughs> it or not. I have no idea what is going on. So um, uh, I am a nurse practitioner who is not technology savvy, apparently, and Zoom meetings are not my thing. <laughs> um, so I guess my first question is what would, what kind of advice would you give to first time candidates? Absolutely. Um, so even before first time candidates, people who are thinking about running for office, I tell people all the time, the, you know, when they say, what should I do before I run for office? I tell them to go work on a campaign and it doesn't mean you have to like put your whole life to the side and staff a campaign, but at least go show up and volunteer, knock on some doors, make some phone calls, you know, yeah. lick some envelopes, do something so that you actually can see what a campaign looks, feels like, and how it should operate. Um, a lot of people go in, uh, don't know what to expect, and people who theoretically or on paper could be fantastic candidates uh, turn out to be not so much because they don't know what actually goes into it, what type of work uh, is going to be required of them. Uh, but as a candidate, it's about showing up everywhere, talking to everybody, but it's also about being smart with the time. Um, you know, if you're running in a specific district, uh, I tell people all the time, you don't need to go to every event. These events seem fun. You get to put on a you know, a nice outfit. You get to go have a cocktail. You get to talk to what you feel like are a lot of people, but so often most of those people aren't going to be able to vote for you. So staying on those doors, you know, if you're, if you're running in a specific district, that time on the doors is going to mean everything. Now, if you're running a bigger race, you know, citywide, countywide, or statewide, then it's a different calculus uh, for those events. But I cannot stress to you, uh, you know, how much the same way I said, I see a lot of people, you know, out of town who are running and it's just, you know, wanting to mix it up. And I mean, these things are fun, right? It's it's what you see on TV, what candidates do, right? It's, it's what it feels like a candidate should be doing, uh, going to these events. But that's what you should do after you're in office. Uh, you know, too often people want their campaigns to be super sexy and campaigns are not sexy. <laughs> campaigns not are enough. hard work. And, you know, it, it, it's just the way that it is. And, you know, you work hard to get to where you want to be, then you get to do the real fun stuff. But even in communities where people's stories or values might be a little bit different than yours, the reality is a lot of people just want to be heard. Uh, and, in you know, this is, uh, well, I truly believe that you'll discover a whole lot of connections and you'll discover that there is a lot more that unites us and divides us. Now, I'm not going to pretend that this happens all the time or every person that disagrees with you is going to be super friendly because that's not the case either. So you need to have thick skin uh, because on the other hand, sometimes you run into people who you agree with 90% of the time and those are the hardest conversations. And so you got to prepare yourself for whatever, keep that thick skin, uh, but you know, stay, stay the course, uh, stay true, don't get knocked off track. And it is about doing this in the election year uh, as it is when you're not asking people for their vote. Absolutely. So funny. It's so funny you say that because I will say um, going to things outside of the district is something I've tried very hard not to do unless it's going to give me um, votes or money. And all I do, everyone says, so what are you spending your time doing? I say, I raise money and I knock doors and I raise money and I knock doors and I see my patients in clinic and put my bed kids to bed and then I raise money and knock doors. It is it is the VVV, votes, volunteers and Venmo because there's no <laughs> V true. word for act, there's no v, v word for act blue. So I just say Venmo, but I mean act blue. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard. It's it's uh, a tricky balance. I uh, am a nurse practitioner, and so I'm in clinic two full days a week, and I can't do any of that for two full days. Yeah. Um, that makes it a little tricky, but um, those are the most important things to me. So can I ask another question, or am I oh, one question only? Yes. 
Okay, good, good. Um, I guess another question I had for you is how do you break past? Because you are younger than me, by the way, which is crazy because I'm by far the youngest person in this race or who has run for this district. And so um, I'm 39, by the way. Okay. Uh, it's it's tricky kind of breaking the mold and breaking through that um, traditional narrative of in Virginia, at least, it's uh, predominantly men over the ages 60, 65 in the General Assembly. And so I guess my question would be, what is your advice to kind of counteract that narrative and traditional mold that you see, uh, uh, I guess, our legislators um, as being? And how do you fight back against that as a non-traditional candidate? Yes, I'll say there are a couple things. Uh, I'll go back to that showing up and just maintaining a presence because that does go a long way. Uh, but also not being shy about your story, sharing it with people, uh, because I can guarantee you your story is going to relate to somebody in some sort of way. So making those collect connections, building those coalitions um, and, you know, having one good mentors or even if they're not mentors, having good examples, people who you see and you say, oh, this person is doing a great job. And you try to, don't be afraid to, you know, take parts of, um, you know, you know, stealing from somebody's playbook, right? There's nothing against the law about that. It, you know, my Congresswoman Gwen Moore, like she's one of my favorite people, one of the most personable people. She is very non-traditional. So I have taken pieces of her playbook. I've taken pieces of Tammy Baldwin's playbook. Like, don't be afraid of that, right? Like be who you are, but there are also, you know, certain things that you can take from other people to make your own. And that helps you. And on top of, uh, you know, on top of all this, being able to help counteract the narrative is what I pride myself on trying to know more than everybody. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't go there and I don't, I don't talk to voters. Like I know everything, but like against your opponents, right? Like that is, that is, that goes a long way. Uh, Cause I remember, you know, knocking on doors when I was 25, I was like, oh, you're young. What do you know? And it's like, you know, you start to talk about the issues and if you know your opponent's record, you can start talking about your opponent's record, what has been going wrong and you know, how you feel that person has, uh, you know, failed the district, failed the city, failed the county, failed whatever. And you talk about your plan. So knowing what you're talking about, right? Like, please don't get a, don't get a big ego, big head. Yeah. Like you want to talk to voters, like, like, you know, looking down on them or anything. Don't do that. Uh, but, you know, no, you know, do your homework, do your research, know what you're talking about. Yep. People can't take your knowledge away from you. It's very true. And that's one of the reasons I decided to run is I feel like if we're going to have if the people we elect into the Virginia General Assembly are going to be the people that get to decide access to contraception, abortion, reproductive health care, and so much more. Like we need a healthcare provider who knows healthcare policy in and out, but we also need a healthcare pro provider who knows healthcare. So. Completely agree. Completely agree. And it was the work that I was doing as an organizer. There were some very specific issues that came up and a lot of those issues specifically impacted the district that I was running to represent. And my, you know, I felt that my opponent did not have uh, a solid enough record on those issues. And I took on a task for it. You know, it was it, my first race too. It was a, it was a tough one, right? Like it was a very tough one. My race for the state assembly. Um, ironically enough, me and the guy are great friends now. It's good. But that doesn't always happen. <laughs> All right. All right. Susanna, thank you so very much. Those were great questions. And we've got a little bit of time left. So what I'd like to do is, Mandela, we have these things called democracy centers, which are very, very, very rural. And we've got a question from our Alabama Democracy Center. You've got ties to Alabama. Deep. And these are, are um, you, you were in, Omega, hopefully, right? I'm sorry. Oh, oh, never mind. I see the red. I'm sorry. <laughs> never mind. It would have been purple. Never mind. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, well, we'll 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 let that go. We'll let that <laughs> go. All right. Um, Alabama has a question, and Virginia had a very similar question 
how do we continue to grow the next generation of leaders in the deep so-called red far right south to change a negative misguided mindset where poor people continue to suffer amid voter suppression and um, other non-people friendly tactics. And then I'm going to add on, how do you engage, again, it's these disengaged voters who maybe their head is on straight, but they just feel so outnumbered. All they want to do is put their heads down and stay out of the way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my ties to Alabama are very deep. Um, graduate Alabama A&M University, mother's from Alabama. Um, was just there a couple months ago. Uh, I will say, and one of my best friends from college is the House Democratic leader in Alabama. So uh, I can tell you for young people, especially, um, I mean, I look at the reaction when the two young men were expelled from the Tennessee Gener General Assembly and how that helped to galvanize and organize people um, because people felt that it was a personal attack on them, right? Like even if they hadn't paid attention to the General Assembly or the state legislature before. And so when these things happen, we can't let it go unchecked. We need to make sure that we are empowering our youth-led organizations. We need to make sure that these youth-led organizations are actually funded and have at least some level of support and some level of guidance and mentorship. So when these things happen, we can quickly organize. And, you know, this generation is more connected than any generation ever in the history of the world. And it will only be more so as time goes on. We need to use every tool in our toolbox uh, to send out that call to uh, get people engaged because too often people just don't know what's going on. And, or I should, I should say, or you mentioned uh, people putting their heads in the sand is they don't believe they have the power to change things. And I try to remind people all the time, like things are constantly changing for somebody. Things are getting better for a whole lot of people. Now there's a choice that we can make. Either we can get involved, we can organize, we can show up and make sure that the positive changes are happening for us in our community, or we can just sit and let it happen. But if we choose to sit and let it happen, it's not just us. It's somebody who is going to have it way worse than us. It is a luxury to be able to just sit and let it happen. You know, if people's living condition is going to continue to get worse, then, you know, that is that will be our fault if it was our choice to do nothing. So, you know, you got to guilt people a little bit sometimes. Oh, I love that. Speaking of uh, guilt, then uh, my question to you is, are you looking at Virginia in 2023 with your pack to support some of our Virginia candidates, especially our women? Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to. And I know Darby from my team is on the call. Um, for people who are interested, uh, you can send a note to Darby at MandelaBarnes.com, D-A-R-B-Y. Um, you know, would love to try to figure that out. We'd love to try to figure that out. All right. And uh, we will send you our list of endorsed candidates. We will also include, um, we've got a previous video of the, original Road to Richmond that we did. Uh, you already know Adele, you already know La Therese, you got a chance to meet Susanna. And then there will be more candidates coming up. So that is very, very, very exciting. I am delighted. Um, and then Alabama, again, here they come with another question. East E wants to know, Give us your two minute spiel on why young people should vote. Well, young people should vote because this is the future. This is your life. And, you know, somebody wants, they, they didn't have to say it to me, but they were explaining. Uh, you know, when somebody told them that they don't do politics, their response was, well, if you don't do politics, politics is going to do you. And the things that are important to you, whether it is your right to live and express yourself as you are, whether it is a right to do what you choose to with your own body, or whether it's 
your right to pursue a country that is free of all this gun violence that we've been experiencing, whether it is addressing climate change, right? These things will only get worse if we don't show up. Now, I choose not to sit powerless, like no matter how hard or difficult the fights are, uh, and young people should get involved. You vote like your life depends on it because your life does depend on it. The life of somebody you care about the lives of somebody you love depend on us showing up to vote, right? Like I had this, I had this, actually I had this conversation with somebody on an airplane just two days ago. And, you know, she, we were going to Milwaukee and, you know, she was younger, um, looked to be in her, you know, mid twenties. Actually she was, she told me she was 27. And, you know, I don't, not, not trying to say this any sort of way, but it was a, it was a pretty big race. Like I was on TV a whole lot last fall. And she was asking me questions. I'm like, oh man, this woman didn't vote. You know, in my mind, so I'm like, because I was, you know, my, I was just on, like, it was just incessant, right? Like I got tired of seeing myself on TV. So I'm like, she didn't vote. <laughs> and, you know, we talked and I'm like, she's like, yeah, you know, I know these issues, you know, especially with, you know, you know, abortion rights and stuff like that. I'm like, and she's, and her, her thought was, you know, she's like, I'm really just kind of like just down the middle on things. She's like, I don't really like politics, just down the middle on certain things. And then she brought up abortion on her own. I'm like, well, there is no down the middle of the road on this. Like there is one party that is hell bent on making sure nobody gets access to an abortion. And there's one party that is fighting for the ability for people to be able, people to, be able to make their own healthcare decisions. Like this is very real. And, you know, she's like, yeah, you know, I'll vote in the presidential elections. And I'm just like, hey, you know, look, it, that's great, you should, but these are the most impactful races. The issues you just lined up. Then she told me she was a nurse. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I'm like, you're in healthcare. I said, think about the people that you care for. Think about how many people you see come into an emergency room because they don't have a primary care physician because they don't have health insurance. Think about how many people you have to send to a social worker right after their visit because they have nowhere else to go. Like, sure, if you don't care about politics, that's fine. But for you to actually provide some sort of continuum of care, some well-rounded uh, care to these patients, like, you know, it is it is your responsibility as a nurse to care about these people, to make sure that they are able to live happy, healthy, and productive lives. And, you know, I hope I got her with that one. I, I hope you did too. Um, our Democracy Center leaders are on fire. Um, here's Alabama again with an idea. Um, he says, and we get former candidates from last elections in Alabama to communicate lessons learned with the new organization. And he means your organization, meaning uh, there were some wonderful candidates in Alabama in 2022 uh, and also in South Carolina. There were uh, wonderful Reverend Will Boyd in Alabama, and there were Black Senate candidates in South Carolina, and just absolutely no support from anybody anywhere. So I'm hoping that some of them might run again, and um, any possibilities that maybe we could convene something with, so you were a candidate and what maybe could they have done differently, if anything? I mean, people just don't believe in Alabama and Mississippi. I know. You say Alabama, you say Mississippi, and people go, well, give me a more real. Uh, Alabama and Mississippi are very real. Yeah, the, the both very real states and also winnable. Um, so that's a always open up to new ideas and how we can flip the South. Thank you. That's where that's where we work. Um, and we won in Alabama in 2017. We did the Doug Jones race. Yep. That was probably our third election. We did Virginia uh presidential in 2016, Virginia um 2017. And then immediately turned around and did Alabama in 2017. Busy, busy, busy. 
That's right. And we have done six elections since December 1st. Uh, I thank you again for all the work y'all are doing. It's just incredibly important. It's impactful. It's going to make a difference. I know it seems like this is a, the longest road, but we, that's why I named my pack the long run, because not expecting things to change overnight. That's right. And again, you've got to plow that road and you've got to set up infrastructure and you've got to give the people somewhere to land so they're like, there's good candidates here. We want to support these good candidates. So I personally am really looking forward to seeing the candidates that you're supporting in a wild off year like 2023. We love elections in Virginia. We love them so much. We do we in Wisconsin too. Yeah, we do in Wisconsin. We just had our oh. April election and our primary was in February. It was like our primary was like 90 days after, maybe 100 days after my race. I was not recovered, but had to jump back in it. Uh, well, well, and and yes, I feel you. We did 2022. We did the Georgia runoff. And then we did the Firehouse primary for Congressional District 2 because we lost Congressman Don McEachin on the 28th of November. Yeah, that was one of my frat brothers, actually. Um, I will say, uh, going back to the questions about young people, um, Wisconsin in the November election had the highest youth turnout in the country. I want to say it was about, it was almost 50% of young voters turned out in November. Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. Fabulous. All the right. Nation. And then... Yeah, I'm seeing a note from one of my other democracy centers. I'm going to read this to you. I love this. Uh, the further you vote down the ballot, the closer the changes to your front door. I love it. I love that one. I, I love that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Any parting thoughts you would like to leave us with? This well, again, has been wonderful. This has been wonderful. And I'll say y'all know how to pick them. So uh, just want to thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> just want to thank you again for having me. Uh, best of luck to the candidates. Um, like I said, please get in touch with Darby. Hope this isn't the last time uh, that we're speaking to each other. Uh, oh, it won't be. Believe me, it won't be. All right. And, um, you know, I'll say we're, I would say that we're hoping for great things, but we're going to work for great things. Uh, That's we're right. Make better happen because better is possible. And I will say that to the end of time uh, because it's absolutely true. Uh, but again, to everybody who joined us today, please step up, support these amazing candidates and support uh, the incredible work Center for Common Ground is doing uh, and getting people out to vote and getting the amazing candidates the support that they need. Thank you, Mandela. Thank you so very, very much. Take care, everybody. Thank you.